Certainly, the theme I was assigned is important. Over the past century, few subjects have provoked as much controversy in the Orthodox world as autocephaly. One need only mention disputes between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Patriarchate of Constantinople concerning the status of the Polish Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church in the Czech lands in Slovakia, and most recently, the Orthodox Church in America, the former North American Russian Metropolia, OCA. There have, of course, also been unilateral claims to autocephaly put forward by at least two Ukrainian groups and by the Macedonian Orthodox Church. We should probably consider them as well. Autonomy also has been a source of controversy. Through much of the 20th century, the Russian Orthodox Church in Constantinople disputed the status of the Finnish Orthodox Church, and more recently, and with high drama, the status of Estonia. And additional examples could be mentioned. Most often, in the case of autocephaly, disagreement has centered on accession to autocephaly, how autocephalous status is attained. But while debate on this subject has proceeded with great acrimony, the nature and content of autocephaly has been left undefined. The word is assumed to have a simple, univocal meaning, but in fact, those who use it tacitly make certain assumptions which others may not share, but which nevertheless color their outlook and arouse their passions. Much the same can be said about autonomy. Clearly, neither term can be understood without consideration of the wider historical context in which they are being used. In present day usage, one might find it in a textbook, a church is termed autocephalous if it possesses, first of all, the right to resolve all internal problems on its own authority independently of other churches, and second, the right to appoint its own bishops, among them the primate, without obligatory expression of dependence on another church. On the other hand, an autonomous church is one whose primate must be appointed or approved in some way by the church that granted it autonomy. Similarity between the two aspects of autocephaly that I just noted and the internal and external sovereignty of the modern state as presented in textbooks in political science, this is hardly coincidental. From the 19th century onward, autocephaly has been understood as radical independence analogous to that which the modern sovereign state enjoys in the secular sphere. The autocephalous state, the autocephalous church, so often re referred to as the local church, the Pomiestvianaya Tserkov, Topiki Ecclesia, this is regarded as the fundamental ecclesiastical organism of which all lesser bodies, dioceses, eparchies, are but parts administrative subdivisions, dependencies. The weaknesses of this understanding have become ever more conspicuous over the past century. Like the international system of sovereign states on which it was patterned, this modern system of autocephalous churches has failed to meet demands placed on it in our own rapidly changing world. Possession of internal sovereignty by no means has assured spiritual health within an autocephalous church, and insistence on external sovereignty has inhibited the creation of effective structures for maintaining communion or even communication between autocephalous churches. All too often, the result has been indifference, absence of common activity, and periodic confrontation. The approach to autocephaly, to ecclesiology rather, lying behind this modern understanding of autocephaly now is widely discredited in theological circles. Though of course its continuing influence can be felt in the practices and official utterances of the autocephalous churches themselves. 
The reliance of this approach on the language and thought patterns of law and diplomacy has given way to a more churchly approach drawing on scripture, liturgy, church fathers. The point of departure for this more recent approach to ecclesiology has been the Eucharist, seen now not just as one of several means of grace at the disposal of the church conceived of as a divinely instituted body politic, but as the very basis for the church's life. And I know in the present company here at St. Sergius, I can take familiarity with this Eucharistic ecclesiology for granted. I mention it now because its insights help explain the evolution of church structures in antiquity, when the fundamental ecclesiastical organism was understood to be the local church, local in this case meaning the church of a relatively compact face-to-face -face community, considerably more limited in its geographic extension than the modern autocephalous local church. Considerably more local, one could say, than the Russian Federation. Though modest in scale, each local church was, if I may use words of late Archbishop Peter Pierre Rillier, uh, each local church was the sacramental manifestation of ecclesial plenitude. These churches related to each other not as parts of a whole, but on the principle of mutual identity. Each in its place was the concrete realization of the Church of God. But this did not negate the need for communion with other local churches, but rather implied it. The mutual identity of the local churches and the profound communion uniting them was expressed most tangibly through the collegiality of their bishops, especially as these met together in council. So long before the establishment of Christianity as the favored religion of the state, before structures for coordination of church life were defined in the form of conciliar canons, ecclesiastical organization in the Roman Empire tended to follow the lines of civil administration. By the fourth century, synods of bishops were meeting with some regularity in most provinces of the empire, typically under the presidency of the bishop of the metropolis, the capital city, to address matters of common concern, to resolve disputes, to elect and ordain their comprovincial colleagues, including their primate. In other words, roughly speaking, and with several important exceptions, the churches of each province constituted an ecclesiastic, an autocephalous entity. These churches didn't become autocephalous, they were autocephalous. They were not granted autocephaly, they had it. It isn't necessary here to trace the process of consolidation that transformed the church structures in the course of the church structures in the course of the 4th and 5th centuries. Out of a constellation of autocephalous ecclesiastical provinces, five major ecclesiastical divisions emerged, this pentarchy of patriarchates whose preeminence in the universal church would be assured by imperial legislation and theological reflection even after any practical significance they had was limited by the rise of Islam in the East and by barbarian invasions in the West. But notwithstanding the ascendancy of Pentarchic theory, in practice there were several exceptions. Churches beside these five patriarchates with the right to appoint all their own bishops, including their primate. The geographic boundaries of the autocephalous churches might coincide with those of civil administration, but neither civil administration nor ecclesiastical boundaries were directly related to political independence or to nationality. And while the bishops of the autocephalous entity were expected to manage their own affairs, they were obliged to do this in accordance with the canons. It was the universal canons and not the particular law of the autocephalous entity 
that set forth basic principles of church order. In short, these autocephalous entities, these autocephalous churches developed in order to strengthen bonds of communion, uniting local churches of a given region with each other and with all the churches. They were intended to unite, not divide, to be practical administrative arrangements. They didn't pretend to self-sufficiency. For many centuries, Roman Byzantine imperial ideology remained intact and with it the sense of belonging to a single Christian commonwealth. But this began to change in the wake of the Latin conquest of Constantinople in 1204, whereas autocephaly formerly had meant independence on a purely ecclesiastical level, now it was related to political independence. Evident in this period are signs of incipient nationalism. This was most conspicuous among the Balkan Slavs, but you can find this also in Greek circles. Uh, for example, intellectuals began to use the word Helen, Greek, in a positive sense. Uh, hitherto, of course, it had meant pagan, as distinct from Christian. But at the same time, a new sense of universalism can be detected. Old symbols of unity and order the emperor and his once universal empire, the pentarchy of patriarchs, were fading in significance. Taking their place on the institutional level was the patriarch of Constantinople, who effectively replaced the emperor as symbol of the unity of the Orthodox Christian world. But nationalism, replete with romantic myths about national origins, language, character, would reemerge as a significant factor in Orthodox church life in the late 18th, the 19th century, and with nationalism, the modern autocephalous church. The first stirrings of this modern nationalism can be felt among educators, intelligentsia, who promoted the study of national languages, history, and culture, but as Pascalis Kitromilidis has observed, nationalism became a real, as opposed to a theoretical, problem for orthodoxy once the peoples of the Balkans rose up in arms against Ottoman rule in the early 19th century. The protracted revolts in the Balkans provided the crucible for the transformation of the orthodox religious communities of the Balkans into modern nations. Part of the transformation involved the radical reshaping of local ecclesiastical communities from branches of ecumenical orthodoxy into components of new nations. Throughout the Balkans, the revolt of subject orthodox populations against Ottoman rule involved on the ecclesiastical level independence from the Patriarch of Constantinople. Because of this coincidence, scholars sometimes explain autocephaly simply as a function of nationalism, as one aspect of national consolidation, a process marked by the nationalization of religion and the sacralization of the nation. But of course, the story is more complex. A sense of national identity in the absence of other factors seldom, if ever, has been sufficient for the establishment of an autocephalous church, at least for one recognized by all its sister churches. What has made a decisive difference is state involvement. Indeed, it has been argued that in the Balkans, national identity itself has been largely a creation of the state. State involvement in the establishment, or one might add, the suppression of autocephalous churches has been motivated by state interests and only secondarily by religious considerations. Multiple examples could be advanced to demonstrate this. Whether in the predominantly orthodox nation states of the Balkans or in the declining Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires, autocephaly assured 
that the ecclesiastical entity in question would serve state interests. The episcopate of the church might have the right to manage its internal affairs, to elect all its own bishops, of course, under close state supervision. But communication with other Orthodox churches was strictly limited, typically carried on through the state's foreign office. With more changes in political geography in the wake of World War I, the issue of accession to autocephaly took on new urgency. After the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the subsequent change, exchange of populations, the Patriarch of Constantinople was left with only a tiny flock in the new Turkish Republic. Perhaps as a consequence, maybe even a happy consequence, the Patriarchate became more inclined than before to emphasize its wider primatial authority within the Orthodox world. Meanwhile, relentless communist persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church brought an end to its once enormous influence for several decades. All this set the stage for a series of confrontations concerning autocephaly, autonomy, and related issues during the remainder of the 20th century. Inter-Orthodox cooperation in the early 1990s began to suggest a way forward. And we've heard in earlier presentations the prehistory, this great and holy council. In 1990 and 1993, meetings of the Preparatory Commission addressed two closely intertwined topics, the diaspora and autocephaly, and it also touched on autonomy. I remember those meetings well. Uh, for one, I was present as an expert not because of ecclesiastical affiliation. At another, I was included in the delegation of the Russian Orthodox Church. My invitation arrived from Geneva to Moscow and was forwarded to me from there. The commission's point of departure in 1990-1993 was background reports from the churches. These texts were, by that point, already over 10 years old. In these, three lines of thinking can be discerned. Uh, first of all, there was the report of the Romanian Orthodox Church. They argued that each autocephalous national church has the right to govern its own national diaspora as it sees fit. Though the report does acknowledge that churches formed as a result of missionary activity constitute a special case, and here I quote, since they belong to a different nationality than the members of the missioning church. In such cases, autocephaly may be envisioned. A second group of reports from churches of Greek heritage appealed above all to Chalcedon Canon 28, a text I think everyone knows, uh, and to its provision for churches among the barbarians. Uh, the argument went on to suggest that uh, only Constantinople has authority in the so-called diaspora, and as for autocephaly, only a council of ecumenical standing can definitively establish an autocephalous church, any interim arrangements depending on approval by Constantinople. The report of Russia the Russian Orthodox Church takes a more pragmatic approach. Like the Romanian approach, it rejects Greek interpretation of Chalcedon Canon 28. Uh, it argues that, in any case, modern situations vary considerably. Whether arising from multiple immigrations or mission, each situation should be considered on its own terms. Whatever their origins, churches of the diaspora, must receive the opportunity to grow into new local churches. In America, the argument goes, where the multiplicity of jurisdictions is in part a result of mission, in part a result of uh, immigration, several possible solutions are possible. Several solutions are possible. Uh, the report concludes that it, uh, the best solution would be for Constantinople to grant autocephaly to its American archdiocese, just as Moscow had in the case of the OCA, so also for the other churches to grant autocephaly to their jurisdictions in North America, and then for these to unite 
is as a single autocephalous church. The difficulty is how can these positions so divergent be reconciled? And in fact, the Inter-Orthodox Preparatory Commission chose not to attempt to reconcile these divergent interpretations of the historical record, but instead to develop procedures and proposals for the future. Although the Inter-Orthodox Preparatory Commission hasn't reached full agreement on it autocephaly, it has agree reached agreement on autonomy. According to the draft text on this subject, granting autonomy to a part of its canonical jurisdiction lies within the exclusive competence of a given autocephalous church. After approving a petition for autonomy, this church issues the appropriate tomos, then notifies the ecumenical patriarchate and the other autocephalous churches of its actions. How are we to evaluate these texts that we now have before us or potentially before us? Like so many of the texts developed in the course of the Great and Holy Council process, the draft text on accession to autocephaly ducks the hard issues. It avoids any reference to the many ecclesi extra ecclesial factors that have affected and in many ways transformed our understanding of autocephaly. It barely mentions nationalism. It doesn't mention statism at all. This makes it difficult to imagine any real progress in inter-Orthodox relations, even if a great and holy council does eventually meet to approve the texts now under consideration. Needed also is constructive engagement with our past. This may be painful. It may also be invigorating. If we know where we have been, it will be easier to know the way forward to fuller communion with God and with each other. 